Homage to him, the Holy One, the Worthy One, the Fully Enlightened One. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So we're going to go over to our screen because we put this up there. We posted it up there. And I think you're going to really enjoy this. Um, let's see. Let me start. We'll just run over these very quickly for you in the beginning so that you have a feel for them. Now, these are the points that are going to, you're going to hear in the sutta as you listen to it. The sutta explains the Buddha's instructions given to a student to achieve the final arrival at truth. It contains all four noble truths. In the sutta, we see how the Buddha explains things to others without being offensive. It demonstrates the difference between accepting something blindly versus believing it only when you can see it for yourself. This was a new way of teaching in the time of the Buddha, leading to some remarkable end results. In the beginning of this sutta, you're, usually you would hear the five things can turn out in two ways. I'm not sure if I'm including that or not, because I'm starting at section 11 of your sutta when we start the reading. Okay. Um, but after the the way the five, two ways that can happen, okay, faith. These are the five things that can turn out in two different ways: faith in what you are doing, approval, oral tradition, reasoned cogitation, and reflective acceptance of a view. Those are the things that are re reviewed in the front part. See where I am. Okay. Then the second point in this is that he stresses the the uh, the importance in the beginning part of the sutta, which I think I'm going to pretty much leave for you to read, because we're going to start at section 11, and we're doing this because we're attempting to have one-hour talks when we do these now. So you check out your teacher by observing their level of greed, of hatred, and delusion of Dhamma knowledge, disposition, and the ability to communicate with you while they're teaching you. It's important that we don't go to um, work with people that we are not getting clear understanding. And as hard as they try, when they have English as a second language from Asia and they're attempting to teach you, things can get mixed up. And one of these days I'm going to do um, a talk on the slippage that occurs in understanding that is, is, you know, you become aware of it if you teach English. And I've taught English in Asia for some time. And you begin to realize the parts where things get slippery and why, because they're taking the wrong definition for a word and using it, you know, instead of examining all five definitions before choosing what to use very clearly. And I did that in Spanish. And I can tell you it's very difficult. So the third part is the most important part for us tonight. What should be done by a student as a format for his training? We ask Master Gotama what is most important for the final arrival at truth. One, having faith in the teachings and in the teacher. Number two, visiting the teacher. Number three, paying respect to the teacher. Number four, giving ear. Number five, hearing the Dhamma. Number six, memorizing the teaching. Number seven, examination of the meaning. Number eight, a reflective acceptance of the teaching. Number nine, enthusiasm. Number 10, 
application of mindfulness, number 11, scrutiny, and number 12, right effort. So this is the first document. Let's see how we can get rid of this one now. Hmm. <laughs> okay, stop share. Let's stop share. Now let's go back to share and we'll go into our document. Okay, so we're in Chanki Sutta. This is based on the translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. It is Majima Nikaya number 95. It's the translation in the middle length sayings, Majima Nikaya, and permission by wisdom publications when used for teaching with added remarks that have been put in by Venerable Vimala Ramsey and Sister Kama. This particular thing says Sister Kama for the reason that it was done probably back in 2006, 2007. But I really kept this one because he had his comments in it as well in your copy that you have. So the first part that I generally, when I'm trying to shorten things, I would skip is what I call the big brag. And I will explain it to you. Um, you know, these people in this one kingdom, uh, they came to the king and he wanted to go visit Godama, the recluse Godama. And everybody got upset because they said, you shouldn't go visit him. You should make him come and visit you because blah, blah, blah. He was, you know, we are you, you king, you have this and this and this, and you're trained in this and this and this, and you know this and this and this, and you're rich and you're famous and you're highborn. You should make him come to you. But then the king turns around and he says, let's go over that again. <laughs> Play it again, Sam. And he says, he starts to explain to the Brahmins the entire background that he knows about uh, Siddhartha Gautama. And so then after he explains how he grew up and how the family he came from and everything about it, he says, so we're all going to go. So the large company of Brahmins, they go and they go over to begin to get involved with visiting the Blessed One. So here we are at section 11. <clears throat> now on that occasion, the Blessed One was seated, finishing some amiable talk with some other of the very senior Brahmins. And at the time sitting in the assembly was a Brahmin student by the name of Kapathika. Young, shaven headed, 16 years old, he was a master of the three Vedas with their vocabularies, their liturgy, phonology and etymology and the histories as the fifth. Skilled in the philology and grammar, he was fully versed in natural philosophy and in the marks of a great man. When the very senior Brahmins were conversing with the Blessed One, he often broke in and interrupted their talk. And then the Blessed One, seeing this happen, he rebuked the Brahmin student thus, let not the venerable student break in and interrupt the talk of the very senior Brahmins when they are conversing. Let the venerable student wait until the talk is finished. This is something a seminary or a, uh, a junior monk cannot do. When this was said, the Brahmin Chanki said to the Blessed One, let not Master Gotama rebuke the Brahmin student. The Brahmin student is a clansman. He is very learned. He has a good delivery. He is wise. He is capable of taking part in the discussion with Master Gotama. And then the Blessed One thought, well, surely, surely this, since the Brahmins honor him, thus the Brahmin student must be accomplished in the scriptures of the three Vedas. And then the Brahmin student thought to himself, when the recluse Godama catches my eye, I shall ask him a question. And then knowing with his own mind, the thought in the Brahmin student's mind, the blessed one turned his eye towards him. Then the Brahmin student thought, the recluse Godama has turned towards me. Suppose I ask him a question. And then he said to the Blessed One, 
Master Gotama in regards to the ancient Brahmanic hymns that have come down through oral transmission and in the scriptural collections, the Brahmins could came, uh, come to the definite conclusion, only this is true. Anything else is wrong. What does Master Gotama say about this? Sorry about that, I was reading off the paper. <laughs> How then, student, among the Brahmins, is there even a single Brahmin who says thus, I know this, I see this, only this is true, anything else is wrong. No, Master Gotama. How then, student, among the Brahmins, is there even a single teacher or a single teacher's teacher back to the seventh generation of teachers who says thus, I know this, I see this, only this is true, anything else is wrong. No, Master Gotama. How then, student, the ancient Brahmin seers, the creators of the hymns, the composers of the hymns, whose ancient hymns that were formally chanted, uttered and compiled, the Brahmins nowadays still chant and repeat them, repeating what was spoken and reciting what was recited. Did even these ancient Brahmin seers say thus, we know this, we see this, only this is true, anything else is wrong? No, Master Gotama. So, student, it seems that among the Brahmins, there is not even a single Brahmin who says thus, I know this, I see this, only this is true. Anything else is wrong. No, Master Gotama. And among the Brahmins, there is not even a single teacher or a single teacher's teacher back to the seventh generation of teachers who says thus, I know this, I see this, only this is true, anything else is wrong. No, Master Gotama. And the ancient Brahmin seers, the creators of the hymns, the composers of the hymns, whose ancient hymns that were formally chanted, uttered and compiled, the Brahmins nowadays still chant and repeat them, repeating what was spoken and reciting what was recited. And did not even these ancient Brahmin seers, did they say thus? We know this, we see this, only this is true. Anything else is wrong. No, Master Gotama. Suppose there was a file of blind men and each in touch with the next. The first one does not see. The middle one does not see. The last one does not see. So too, student, in regard to their statement, the Brahmins seem to be like a file of blind men. The first one does not see, the middle one does not see, the last one does not see. What do you think, student? That being so, does not the faith of the Brahmins turn out to be groundless? The Brahmins honor this not only out of faith, Master Gotama, they also honor it as oral tradition. Student, first you took your stand on faith, now you take your speaking on oral tradition. There are five things, student, that may turn out in two different ways here and now. What five are they? Faith, approval, oral tradition, reasoned consideration, and reflective acceptance of a view. These five things may turn out in two different ways here and now. Now something may be fully accepted out of faith, yet it may be empty, hollow, 
and false. But something else may not be fully accepted out of faith, and yet it may be factual, true, and unmistaken. Again, something may be fully approved of, yet it may be empty, hollow, and false. But something else may not be fully approved of, and yet it may be factual, true, and unmistaken. Again, something may be well transmitted, and yet it may be empty, hollow, and false. But something else may not be well transmitted, yet it may be factual, true, and unmistaken. Again, something may be well considered, yet it may be empty, hollow, and false. But something else may not be considered yet. It may be factual, true, and unmistaken. Again, something may be well reflected upon, and yet it may be empty, hollow, and false. But something else may not be well reflected upon, and yet it may be factual, true, and unmistaken. Well, under these conditions, it is not proper for a wise man who preserves truth to come to the definite conclusion, only this is true, anything else is wrong. Hmm. But uh, Master Godama, in what way is there the preservation of truth? How does one preserve truth? We may ask Master Godama about the preservation of truth. If a per person has faith, student, he preserves truth when he says, my faith is thus but he does not yet come to the definite conclusion, only this is true, anything else is wrong. In this way, student, there is the preservation of truth. In this way, he preserves truth. In this way, we describe the preservation of truth. But as yet, there is no discovery of truth. Now, if a person approves of something, he preserves truth when he says, my approved of the ideas are thus. My approving of the ideas are thus. But he, he does not yet come to the definite conclusion, only this is true, anything else is wrong. In this way, student, there is the preservation of truth. But in this way, he preserves truth. In this way, he we describe the preservation of truth. But as yet, there is no discovery of truth. If he receives an oral tradition about something, he preserves truth when he says, my oral traditions are thus. But he does not yet come to the definite conclusion, only this is true, anything else is wrong. In this way, student, there is the preservation of truth. In this way, he preserves truth. In this way, he we describe the preservation of truth. But as yet, there is no discovery of truth. If he reaches a conclusion based on reasoned consideration about something, he preserves truth, but he says, my reasoned considerations are thus, but he does not come to the definite conclusion. Only this is true, anything else is wrong. In this way, student, there is the preservation of truth. In this way, he preserves truth. In this way, we describe the preservation of truth. But as yet, there is no discovery of truth. If he gains a reflective acceptance of a view, he preserves truth when he says, my reflective acceptance of this view is thus. But he does not come to the definite conclusion, only this is true, anything else is wrong. In this way, the student 
there is the preservation of truth. In this way, student, he preserves truth. In this way, we describe the preservation of truth. But as yet, there is no discovery of truth. In that way, Master Gotama, there is the preservation of truth. In that way, one preserves truth. In that way, we recognize the preservation of truth. But in what way, Master Gotama, is there discovery of truth? In what way does the discovery of truth occur? We ask Master Gotama about the discovery of truth. Here, student, a monk may be living in dependence on some village or town. And then a householder or a householder's son goes to him and investigates him in regard to three kinds of states. In regards to states based on greed, in regard to states based on hate, and in regard to states based on delusion. Are there in these, this venerable one any states based on greed such that with his mind obsessed by these states, while not knowing, he might say, I know, or while not seeing, he might say, I see, or he might urge others to act in a way that would lead to their harm and suffering for a long time. Well, as he investigates him, he comes to know there are no such states based in greed in the vener this venerable one. The bodily behavior and the verbal behavior of this venerable one are not those of one affected by greed. This is because this monk, he keeps his precepts closely. And this is what Bhante talks about. That is why they are saying it in this way in the sutta. And the Dhamma that this venerable one teaches is profound, hard to see and hard to understand, peaceful and sublime, unattainable by mere reasoning, subtle to be experienced by the wise. This phrase happens again in Sutta number 72 in section 18 in the discussion with Vacha, who seems to think when he's talking to the Buddha that certain things can be learned just by reasoning and just by, it would be like everybody reading books and saying they can learn the Dhamma. It doesn't work that way. There's two parts to succeeding at the Buddha's teaching. One is the comprehension of the Dhamma and the other one is seeing and witnessing direct knowledge, knowing things by seeing them. Let's remember that part. Okay, back to the Sutta. This Dhamma cannot easily be taught to one who is affected by greed. When he has investigated him and seen that he's purified from states based on greed, he next investigates him in regards to states based on hate. Are there in this venerable one any states based on hate such that with his mind obsessed by those states while not knowing, he might say, I know this, I know that. Or while not seeing, he might say, I see this, I see this way. And he might urge others to act in a way that would lead them to their own harm and suffering for a long time. As he investigates him, he comes to know there are no such states based on hate in this venerable one. The bodily behavior and the verbal behavior of the venerable one are not those of one affected by hate. And the Dhamma and that, is, that this venerable one teaches is profoundly hard to see and hard to understand, yet peaceful and sublime, unattainable by mere reasoning, very subtle to be experienced by the wise. Now remember these references to the word wise in our training every time and those to be experienced by the wise, by those students who understand how the dependent origination works 
with the seven links that we practice with in daily life. The Dhamma cannot easily be taught by one affected by hate. So when he has investigated him and has seen that he is purified from states based on hate, he next investigates him in regard to states based on delusion. Now delusion, Bhante's telling you, means this monk is one who takes things personally. If the monk takes things personally, then you be careful when you're listening to how he's explaining things. Are there in this venerable one any states based on delusion such that with his mind obsessed by those states, while not knowing, he might say, I know, while not seeing, he might say, I see it. And he might urge others to act in a way that would lead them to harm and suffering for a long time. As he investigates him, he comes to know there are no such states based on delusion in this venerable one. The bodily behavior and the verbal behavior of this venerable one are not those of one affected by delusion. And this means that the monk is not one who takes things, they are one who is taking things impersonally, not taking them personally. So they're not believing everything is me, it is mine, it is myself. They've already practiced and established very clearly. Everything in my experience is not me. It is not mine. It is not myself. It is not who I am. It is the function of my sense doors and my experience through the sense doors according to dependent origination. And the Dhamma that this venerable one teaches is profound, hard to see, and hard to understand, peaceful and sublime, unattainable by mere reasoning. It is subtle to be experienced by the wise. And he keeps pointing this out. It's subtle to be experienced. It must be experienced. That's why Gautama brings forth the new teaching method. Seeing is the only way. Direct knowledge. Knowledge by seeing it in how, how do you see it? In the meditation. The Dhamma cannot be easily taught by one affected by delusion. When he has investigated him and has seen that he is purified from states based on delusion, Bhante says, because he very closely practices what he teaches and keeps the precepts in an impersonal way, then he places his faith in him. You can place faith in that teacher. He goes to the teacher trusting that he does understand and has experienced the teaching clearly and that he can teach others how to see it also. Filled with faith, one visits a trustworthy teacher or monk and pays respect to him. And this Bhante says, is after he has considered what should be considered about a teacher, first as described earlier in the sutta. Having paid respect to him, he gives ear. That means you listen intently. This means while at a Dhamma talk, one keeps one's eyes open, does not fold their arms whilst listening or cross their legs to block out new information and listens intently to what is said when the Dhamma is being taught. They take notes to remember it with questions to ask later on. One listens very carefully so they can test what is said in the meditation practice and in life. Everything should be tested and usable in life. Because if a teacher is not repeating the words of the Dhamma very precisely, but rather just winging it, so to speak, then this can be hard to do sometimes, difficult to follow what should be done. When he gives ear intently, he hears the Dhamma. And this can be hard to describe. What is said registers in the heart and the mind to be clear and true and usable in life. This is important. Having heard the Dhamma, he memorizes it and he closely studies the meaning of the teachings. 
he has memorized. Memorizing sections of the suttas after they are explained can be extremely valuable for you in many situations in life. You can take a sutta, memorize it, and then when somebody has something going on in a discussion or dispute, you can pop up a section of the sutta and settle it just like that. I've done it in university classes in psychology and ethics and history. And it's very interesting how useful the Chachaka Sutta can be to memorize. It's one of the easiest ones to memorize. Seems long, but it's not long. It only has six parts, six sense doors, six parts to remember. When he closely contemplates the meaning, he gains a reflective acceptance of these teachings. When you hear something, that is a first exposure to it. Then when it interested, interested you, you reflect on it or you contemplate it a while and see how it makes perfect sense as you see it in life and happens again and again. And then when he has gained a reflective acceptance of those teachings, zeal, meaning here enthusiasm, springs up. As the truth of something really hits you, because your experience makes you know, you know it to be true, as in you see it. And then another level of realizing and internalizing the truth takes place and enthusiasm wells up inside of you. And my favorite example of this is when we practice our meditation cycle and someone comes to an interview and they tell us that they actually saw the cessation of craving mind state, suddenly saw that happening one time, or they've realized a Nietzsche after witnessing it completely hundreds of times, they had heard, you know, they had witnessed it hundreds of times. And then they would come to Bhante and say, you know, something really neat happened today. <laughs> They know that the such a state is real and it hits you home. You really get it. You feel it in your heart and your head. It doesn't happen when you're reading. It's not, not as often. It can happen sometimes, but not as regularly. When enthusiasm has sprung up, he applies his mindfulness. And this mindfulness is his observation power. It's activated while in his meditation to see precisely how any teaching point works within deep meditation. He realizes how to use the four noble truths, dependent origination, and the three characteristics that are intertwined and even then apply them properly in this case while teaching. Having applied his mindfulness, he thoroughly scrutinizes. Now, one can read a book, for instance, to just enjoy it, or one can scrutinize it carefully to see how it was written, how it was put together. And so this means that he closely inspects how that particular point also works in life, not just in his meditation, and he observes things more closely around him as well as in his meditation. This is what we're asking you to do with dependent origination. Make it come alive. See it happening in groups of people. See it happening in clusters of people. See it happening when there's a crisis. Watch how it works. Having thoroughly inspe inspected, he strives. Now, this is where he applies his persistence to practice the four steps of right effort. Right effort and right striving are the same thing. Right striving simply means right effort became automatic. When we look in the texts, we find out that right striving is written in the same exact paragraph as right effort. Upon examining the suttas where this happens throughout the text, we begin to realize that right effort and right striving advance in the same way as right as the five faculties 
advance into becoming five powers. It makes perfect sense. Right effort has four steps. Recognize any unwholesome mind state. Release the unwholesome mind state and relax the head. Bring up a wholesome mind state. Resmiling is the fastest. And then keep the wholesome mind state going and produce more just like it as you return to the meditation and he repeats the cycle as needed when he is distracted away. And he keeps going and going and repeating that cycle over and over again. And the mind will click if you're doing it all the time, when you're driving, walking, dealing with people at work, working out disputes with your family everywhere. You use it, use it, use it. And suddenly your mind goes, oh, that's what you want me to do. You don't want me to react. You want me to respond. Resolutely striving. He realizes the supreme truth and sees it for by penetrating it with wisdom. Once everything is in perfect balance and conditions are just right, then he sees with wisdom, which means seeing and realizing the impersonal nature of all of the links of dependent origination to be the truth of how things actually work and how to reduce and even totally escape from suffering in this life. In this way, student, there is the discovery of truth. In this way, one discovers truth. In this way, we describe the discovery of truth, but as yet, there is no final arrival at truth. In that way, Master Gautama, there is the discovery of truth. In that way, one discovers truth. In that way, we recognize the discovery of truth. But in what way, Master Gautama, is there the final arrival at truth? In what way does one finally arrive at truth? We ask Master Gautama about the final arrival at truth. The final arrival at truth, student, lies in the repetition, development, and cultivation of those same things. Filled with faith, one visits a trustworthy teacher, a monk, and pays respect to him. And having paid respect to him, he gives ear intently while all other thoughts fall away. When he gives ear, he hears the Dhamma. Having heard the Dhamma, he memorizes it and repeats it over and over. He closely studies the meaning of the teachings he has memorized. And when he closely contemplates their meaning, he gains a reflective acceptance of those teachings. And when he has gained a reflective acceptance of those teachings, enthusiasm springs up. When enthusiasm has sprung up, he applies his mindfulness, his observation power. Having applied his mindfulness, he thoroughly inspects. Having thoroughly inspected, he strives, resolutely striving. He realizes the supreme truth and sees it by penetrating it with wisdom. Taking everything that he just saw and weaving it into dependent origination. And in this way, one discovers the final arrival at truth. In this way, student, there is the final arrival of truth. In this way, one finally arrives at truth. In this way, we describe in this teaching the final arrival at truth. In that way, Master Gautama, there is a final arrival at truth. In that way, one finally arrives at truth. In that way, we recognize the final arrival at truth. But what, Master Gautama, is most helpful for the final arrival at truth? We must ask Master Gautama about the thing most helpful for the final arrival at truth. Striving is most helpful for the final arrival at truth, student, because if one does not strive, one will not finally arrive at truth. But because one strives, one does finally arrive at truth. 
And that is why striving is most helpful for the final arrival at truth. But what, Master Gotama, is the most helpful for the striving? We asked Master Gotama about the, most, the thing most helpful for striving. Thorough inspection is most helpful for striving student. If one does not thoroughly inspect, one will not strive. But because one thoroughly inspects, one strives. That is why thorough inspection is most helpful for striving. But what, Master Godama, is most helpful for thorough inspection? We ask Master Godama about the thing most helpful for thorough inspection. Application of mindfulness is most helpful for thorough inspection of the Dhamma student. If one does not apply one's mindfulness one will not thoroughly inspect the Dharma. But because one applies one's mindfulness, one thoroughly inspects the Dharma. This is why application of mindfulness is most helpful for thorough inspection. But what Master Gudama is most helpful for application of mindfulness? We ask Master Gudama about the thing most helpful for application of mindfulness. Enthusiasm is the most helpful for application of mindfulness student. If one does not arouse enthusiasm, one will not apply one's mindfulness, but because one arouses enthusiasm, one applies one's mindfulness. And that is why enthusiasm is most helpful for the application of mindfulness. But what, Master Gotama, is most helpful for enthusiasm? We ask you about what's the most helpful for enthusiasm. A reflective acceptance of the teachings is most helpful for enthusiasm student. If one does not gain a reflective acceptance of the teachings, enthusiasm will not spring up, but because one gains a reflective acceptance of the teachings, enthusiasm springs up. That is why a reflective acceptance of the teachings is most helpful for enthusiasm. But what, Master Gotama, is most helpful for a reflective acceptance of the teachings? We ask Master Gotama about the thing most helpful for a reflective acceptance of the teachings. Detailed study, scrutiny of the meaning is most helpful for a reflective acceptance of the teachings, student. If one does not do a detailed study of their meaning, one will not gain a reflective acceptance of these teachings. But because one does a detailed study of their meaning, one gains a reflective acceptance of the teachings. That is why detailed study of the meaning is most helpful for the reflective acceptance of the teaching. But what Master Gotama is most helpful for detailed study of the meaning? We ask Master Gotama what is the most helpful thing for detailed study of meaning. Memorizing the teachings is most helpful for the detailed studying of the meaning student. If one does not memorize a teaching, one will not do a detailed study of its meaning. But because one memorizes a teaching, one does a detailed study of its meaning. But what Master Gotama is most helpful for memorizing the teachings? We ask Master Gotama about the thing most helpful for memorizing the teachings. Hearing the Dhamma repeatedly is most helpful for memorizing the teachings. That means hearing suttas repeatedly over and over again, someone said, but don't, I've heard that sutta. Well, 
I've heard that sutta hundreds of times and still I might sit there and listen to Bhante teach it and all of a sudden have a great realization pop up. It didn't come up before, but all of a sudden it happens after a hundred times. They sink in. It's not just that they think sink into you, it's that as you're practicing and you're advancing, the beginner doesn't hear what the middle level student hears and the advanced student hears more than the middle level student. You never get over listening to the suttas. If one does not hear this Dhamma repeatedly, one will not memorize the teachings, but because he hears the Dhamma repeatedly, suddenly he memorizes the teachings. And that is why hearing the Dhamma is most helpful for memorizing the teachings. But what Master Gotama is most helpful for hearing the Dhamma? We ask Master Gotama about the thing most helpful for hearing the Dhamma. Giving ear intently is most helpful for hearing the Dhamma student. If one does not give ear intently, one will not hear the Dhamma. But because you give ear intently, one hears the Dhamma. That is why giving ear intently is most helpful for hearing the Dhamma. But what, Master Gotama, is most helpful for giving ear intently? We ask Master Gotama about the thing most helpful for giving ear intently. <clears throat> Paying respect to a teacher or a monk is most helpful for giving ear intently. If one does not pay respect to the teacher or monk, one will not give ear intently. But because we pay respect to the teacher or monk, one gives the ear intently, and that is why paying respect to the teacher is most helpful for giving ear intently. And what Master Godam is most helpful for paying respect to the teacher or monk? We ask you what is the most helpful thing for paying respect to the teacher monk? Visiting the teacher monk is most helpful for paying respect student. If one does not visit the teacher, one will not pay respect to him. But because one visits the teacher, one pays respect to him. And that is why visiting is most helpful for paying respect. And what Master Gotama is most helpful for visiting a teacher monk? We ask Master Gotama about the thing that is most helpful for visiting a teacher. Faith is the most helpful for visiting a student. If faith in a teacher does not arise, then one will not visit him. But because faith in the teacher arises, one visits them. That is why faith is the most helpful for visiting a teacher. We asked Master Gotama about the preservation of truth and Master Gotama answered about the preservation of truth. We approve and accept the answer and so we are satisfied. We ask Master Gotama about the discovery of truth. We ask him about the final arrival of truth. We asked him about the most helpful thing for the final arrival at truth. And we ask Master Gotama and that he answered us and we approve and accept his answers for those things. And for formally Master Gotama, we used to think, who are those bald, pated recluses, these swarthy, menial offspring of the kinsmen's feet that they would understand the Dhamma? Who do they think they are, these monks? Magnificent, Master Gotama. Magnificent, Master Gotama. Master Gotama has made the Dhamma clear in many ways, as though he were turning upright what had been overthrown, revealing what was hidden, showing the way to one who was lost and holding up a lamp in the dark for those who have eyesight to see forms. From today, Master Gotama, remember me as a lay follower who has come to you for refuge for life. 
So this is the end of the Chonki Sutta. And we are going to just do uh, the closing prayer, but we're coming right back to you after that. So take a break for a second, if a minute if you want to, because we're going to record this in two sections this time. And then we'll go into questions. And we will be back in just a moment. But let's first, um, let's the Chonki Sutta. We have completed the Chonki Sutta number 95, and we've gone over the straight through Sutta. And hopefully this is shorter than it would have been if we kept the questions. One more time, we'll say our prayer at the end of our session, okay? May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus worn it for all kinds of merit. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Share this information. Thank you. Climb your mountains and have a good time this week and stay inside if you need to. If you're in a red area, be careful. Take care, be safe, wear your mask. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.